Hello, welcome to security, cryptography, whatever. I'm Deirdre. I'm David. <laughs> I'm Tom. And then we have a special guest today, Raphael Robert from Phoenix R&D. Hi, Raphael. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah. He's our special guest today because we're talking about MLS messaging layer security, a new almost done IETF standard. That's right. Like, what is what is the status? <laughs> So the status is uh, we are almost done because MLS has received a positive review from the ISG, which is the, the steering group at ITF. So that means nice. the protocol is essentially done. Yes. What's left is what's called the RFC editor phase. Um, so during that time, <laughs> essentially some uh, polishing happens, some wordsmithing. I think they have a style guide. And that takes, it can take a few weeks, it can take a few months. I think the, the current guesstimate from the uh, the chairs of the working group was like a couple of months from now. But uh, it also means that the, the authors of, uh, of the document cannot really change anything at this point. Nothing fundamental mm -hmm. anymore. Cool. So, yeah. Very good. Congratulations. I am a, a co-author on, on an IRTF document that we hope will be reaching a similar phase soon. So kudos nice. on making it all the way through. <laughs> for a much larger protocol. Before we get into the weeds too much, can you tell us a little bit more about the protocol messaging layer security? MLS sounds similar to TLS, but it's about a messaging protocol. That is true, and, and the similarity is very much on purpose, I think. But uh, I'll get into the details in a bit. So on a high level, MLS is a protocol for end-to-end -end encryption, um, and specifically in groups. So it can be in very small groups, in groups of two, but it can also be in much larger groups with uh, thousands of members, essentially. Ooh. When you say thousands, is that like several thousand or is that like exactly 1,024, like in some groups? No, def definitely several. So there is no like practical uh, upper limit. I think there's a theoretical limit of 1 billion. Uh, but before Ooh. you reach that, you run into a lot of other problems that have nothing to do with MLS. <laughs> Uh -huh. So in theory, it can grow quite large. Uh, we haven't nice. seen really large deployments yet. I think Cisco has rolled it out a while back from an earlier draft, and they're running it on calls with, I think, more than a thousand participants. So I think this is the largest, you know, real life deployment we have so far. But Very who nice. knows? I, I expect to see larger groups than that. Awesome. And so can you tell us more about where MLS came from? We have Signal Protocol. Signal Protocol is a bunch of things all wearing a, a hat that says, I am Signal. It's not necessarily just one thing. It's, a, it's several things together, I would say, in the kind of general understanding, uh, rather than like a formally modeled protocol understanding. Can you tell us a little bit more about how MLS came to be? Yeah, sure. So around like five or six years back, like across the industry, um, the, there was a problem that encrypting in groups was not very efficient. So right. what we had at that point were essentially one-to-one -one protocols. So we call them pairwise yep. protocols. Um, there was yep. OTR v3, um, then there was Signal, which at the time was called the Double Ratchet plus X3DH. It still has that under the hood, right? Like, it do still we, has or that, we have, yes. we just... Though, I mean, I've, it's a good point you raise. Um, I'm not sure what exactly the signal protocol is, but essentially it's yeah. a sum of all these, you know, technical subcomponents. Um, cool. So the, yeah, yeah. The, the more comparable ones would be double ratchet and X3DH, essentially, if you want cool. to compare Thank it to you. MLS. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So long story short, that was and still is a, a great protocol, but it doesn't scale very mm -hmm. well in groups. Uh, mm -hmm. So what we've seen, for example, um, WhatsApp that has implemented the protocol used something on top of that called sender keys, which yeah. essentially uh, uses a signal protocol or double ratchet to bootstrap uh, another much smaller protocol where uh, keys are being distributed among all the members of a group. And then that mm -hmm. key material is reused to encrypt messages exactly once. So that is way more efficient than using yeah. a pairwise protocol. But on the security cool. side, it's pretty bad because um, <laughs> all you get is for secrecy, if you want. Mm -hmm. But having post-compromise security is really mm -hmm. expensive. And then mm -hmm. you end up not doing it very frequently. So this is 
Like on, on a technical level, this is what MLS wanted to solve. Got it. And post-compromise security as a refresher is after a secret has been exposed, the continually running the protocol with honest participants will heal basically your your shared secret um, yes, after it's been yes. exposed. Yeah. Cool. Very good. We're, we're talking about when, when we talk about the WhatsApp group problem in my head, I have sort of a division between like the group that we're talking about when we're making plans to go to dinner and then <laughs> the group that we're talking about when we're thinking something on the scale of a telegram group, right? Mm. Or a Slack channel. Right. Where like signal is probably fine scalability wise for organizing a dinner, but not a good way to run a Slack channel. Mm. Is that, that's, that's roughly like the way to think about it. Yeah, probably. I mean, phones and computers get faster every year. So wh whereas, you know, the, the size of a social group doesn't necessarily increase on so that sense. Um, a signal is, you know, increasingly apt to encrypt for smaller groups. But what I heard several times is that if you, if you do have larger groups, um, then battery life, you know, is a concern, even, even if it oh. feels snappy enough from a user's perspective. So, you know, vendors of, of popular messaging apps, let's say, they, they really care about the performance there. Of course, you know, Telegram style groups, uh, that's the other extreme. And, and there you could ask if that is still a messenger, even or, or if it's some sort of social network at that point. Mm. And, and to what extent end to end encryption makes sense in a really, really large group. But there is something in between, uh, also for business communication, where you could have hundreds or thousands of employees in, in one group, so that you run into limits, yes. I can imagine the apples who are over 100,000 strong definitely would like their, you know, all their communication, even if they're having all their employees on one Apple Slack to have usable end-to-end -end encryption and, you know, efficient, not just uh, usable. Okay, so we had originally OTR, Signal, pairwise. If you have a thousand people in a Signal group, which I think you can do and you've been able to do for a while, you have to do pairwise ratcheting and key agreement between all of these parties. And then they layer some other stuff on top. It's kind of straightforward to kind of get a sense of how that would work with Signal, where mm -hmm. like the whole protocol comes down to essentially this Diffie Hellman ratchet. Like, mm -hmm. you know, every time we're sending a message or whatever, we're going to, you know, renegotiate a new ratcheting key forward. Right. And you see how that would work pairwise. And then like, I'm a little familiar with like the earlier specs for MLS, but like the general approach of how you would do that for a group without having to run the protocol one for one between every pair of participants. Right. Like how does that roughly work? Yeah, excellent question. So on, on a very high level, uh, MLS uses a binary tree to solve exactly that problem. So a binary nice. tree is essentially a mechanism that converts a linear problem into a logarithmic one. Um, mm -hmm. If you're lucky, it doesn't work with all problems, unfortunately. But um, <laughs> so what happens there is that there is a key agreement among all the members of a group. Mm -hmm. And so the group needs to warm up a little bit before it becomes efficient <laughs> in the sense that every participant needs to update their key material once. But after that okay. is done, you can essentially rotate key material or remove people from the group uh, in O of mm -hmm. log N, uh, N being the number of members in the group. And members of the group is keys, d N device keys, yes, not that's, just that's a, good a point. user. Um, so... MLS is fairly abstract in that, and it, it could be users, mm -hmm. it could be their devices. Uh, the recommendation is to have unique key material per device and, and not copy mm -hmm. keys from one device to another for obvious but reasons. But it's not prohibitive against that scenario if you had some well-motivated scenario. That's an interesting point about MLS, yeah. right? Because that problem has motivated other kind of bespoke protocols, mm -hmm. you know, come up with ways to like, if I add a device, sync up the keys or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you get to the point where it's efficient to fan out to huge numbers of people, then you might as well just give, then your problem is with group membership at that point, right? It's just, is it okay <laughs> for this person to join the group? But it's no longer, how do we sync keys up? Well, when we talk about it being log N with respect to the number of keys, the log N there is the number of key update operations we're talking about. It is the number, is it the number of scalar molts or whatever in the elliptic curve algorithm? Like what's the actual figure of merit we're talking about? Um, yeah, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Um, so essentially um, it's based on CAMS and mm -hmm. so CAMS is DH uh, under the hood if it's not post-quantum resistant. So essentially, yeah. But, it, 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 
but MLS supports post-quantum chems. Yes, I, in- I dropped that on purpose. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but, but essentially it is on, on an abstract level, it is, you know, iterations of, um, you know, whatever the crypto primitive is going to be, uh, including also then the, the payload size of the, of the resulting message. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So instead of pairwise, we have this group tree, binary tree structure based on chems. So that when we we have a little bit of bootstrapping, but we create the group, we add keys, devices slash users to the group tree structure. The tree chem, is it still called tree chem? Did it yeah, get another that, name that change? Is correct, cool. Yes. Good. And then every add key rotation or update is it update for any one member or any one key, or is it just like a global update, or is there a difference? So members can update their key material. And what okay. that means is, um, so they, they sample some some random new encryption keys um, mm-hmm. and that gives them post-compromise security. So the, um, nice. the threat model here is that we have a notion of a session in a way. Uh, okay. And this session is super long, meaning mm-hmm. it, it starts when you enter the group and it ends when you leave the group. And that can be years essentially. So. The underlying assumption is that during that time, your device could get compromised one way or another. Mm-hmm. And post-compromise security means that you can actually get out of, the, of that situation if the compromise is not long-term. So you okay. should actually regularly update your key material, uh, at which point you send what's called a commit message in the MLS mm-hmm. jargon to everybody. And that message is so has a number of chems in it, uh, log n. And that's, but it's still one message and, and that is being distributed to everybody. So everybody receives the same message and they pick okay. whatever can is appropriate for them. So in, if you picture a binary tree, all the, the members are at the leaves and then these chems, essentially they're on the path of the updating member all the way to mm-hmm. the root. And, and the length of that path is log n. Excellent. And then, of course, you have your delete operation. So you can leave and delete yourself or the admin, air quotes, of the group or any. I think this goes into a higher layer of MLS, which is sort of like the application level of like who is in charge or who maintains the edit bits of who can add people, remove people from the group. So that might get us into what things MLS, the protocol, is not solving in this first iteration, which... Kind before of, yeah. we, yeah, before we get there, like, the, the, the one place where I, I feel like I don't have a great intuition for how this works is yeah. I see how we build the group membership and I see how we key a group. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, like assume that we're in some steady state of group membership. I under I, I have an intuition for how we can have a binary tree of, you know, key agreements or whatever to, you know, make the whole group addressable from a single key or a subgroup addressable from some sub key or whatever. And then do that by like individual pairwise, like between like just a couple of members and then kind of aggregate that up. That makes sense to me. Where I'm not clear is how the ratcheting part of this works, right? Like, obviously, it does ratchet, right? But, like, the post-compromise security that we're talking about, like, I see how we update the tree when group members get added or removed or when somebody adds a device, right? But as the protocol runs and people are sending thousands of messages, uh, what, what's updating? So, I mean, what's updating uh, when, when you send an update is that, first and foremost, you update your own, you know, encryption key pair. And that is what gives you post-compromise security. So, you know, if... If you start using uh, a new key pair and I cam a message to that, that's essentially PCS. It's as simple as that. So, but in order for that to work in the whole group and in order for you not to distribute your key like individually to everybody and then everybody having to you know, individually also send messages, um, that's where the binary tree comes in. So mm-hmm. instead of encrypting it uh, individually to everybody, you encrypt it to this tree. Um, So, yeah, I understand that that's a bit uh, abstract at this point. There is, let's say that every member uh, of the group has access to a certain part of the tree. And so one of these scams that that go from your leaf to the root, you know, is going to be interesting for me because I will have the key material to at least decrypt one of them. Got it. Yeah. And essentially what we're doing is like, in the sense of designing a ratchet or whatever, all we're really we're doing is we're abstracting away the single person that we were talking to before and replacing it with kind of like a set of possible keys that we're sending it to. And then everything else kind of runs the same way. 
So it's just, it's, it's just that in the abstract, when we're sending that message or when we're kind of running the, the messaging protocol, we're talking to a key that, you know, resolves to a group of people as opposed to just one person. Yeah. Good. Okay. I'm not totally off on this. So is it reliant then on each user effectively kind of updating their key after they send a message? So users should do that regularly or devices should do it like fully automatically regularly. And so the more often you do it, the better, obviously, and you need to find some sweet spot of, of what works and what doesn't. And of course, if the groups are really large, you cannot do it as often anymore. Then, like intuitively, that, that would be too noisy. And it depends on what your threat model is exactly. But you should definitely do it when you join the group and, and then with some regularity afterwards. And going back to what Deirdre said earlier, at the protocol level, like everybody is equal in the group, like it's it's full democracy mm-hmm. or full anarchy, depending on how you want to call it. <laughs> and th- there's no notion of admins and non-admins. And that is something you can implement essentially on the application layer above. And it's fairly simple because all you need is agreement on who's an admin and who's not. Mm-hmm. And this is where uh, MLS is actually quite interesting in the sense that you, so the the whole thing chronologically is divided into epochs. And right. since messages have to be ordered, which sounds like a downside at first, and, and to some extent it is, but it has a huge upside. And that means that everybody can agree on state. So it's a great mechanism to uh, synchronize state among different devices uh, asynchronously. Mm. So if you have some sort of policy on who's an admin and who's not, that's very easy to sync that among all the clients that participate in a group. And everybody nice. completely agrees. And you even have a cryptographic guarantee because, you know, these, this arbitrary data can get hashed into the key material. So you, you have a cryptographic guarantee that everybody sees the same list of admins, sees the same list of, of non-admins and, and general members and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And then it becomes very easy because if a non-admin tries to add someone to a group, you just drop that message, just reject it. If the server doesn't do that for you, you can still do that at the client level. That's cool. That sounds like it makes encrypting and syncing stateful things in a private way very doable as well, which is like, I don't, I probably will throw these links in the in the show notes, but Signal didn't have this sort of uh, nice syncable group state from the start because they, they basically built groups out of these pairwise uh, double ratchets and, and triple dippy Hellmans. And they built a thing that basically allowed the group membership and other group metadata to remain private from Signal, the service itself, with anonymous credentials and encrypting the thing and you being able to disassociate who is updating the Signal group metadata from who is authenticating against the Signal server with anonymous credentials and things like this. It sounds like MLS, because of this cryptographically secured group metadata, because of the tree cam, allows this to be easier, kind of easier to do with cryptographic guarantees. But that's, to be clear, that's not in MLS. It's a thing that MLS may enable service providers to do in a nice way. But that, that's super interesting. It's like a thing I didn't realize that it should have occurred to me, right? But like on the spectrum of ways to, so first of all, like in a group, in a secure group messaging system, group membership is key distribution, right? Like it's mm-hmm. it's the core security decision that you're making for the protocol is who's going to be allowed to, once you're allowed in the group, you can read messages to the group, you have mm-hmm. the keys for the group, right? So like there's a spectrum of ways to approach that where like the original signal way of doing it was essentially that if you wanted to create a group, you would come up with an unguessable secret, just like a 128-bit number or something like that. Broadcast that to your your friends, the people you wanted to be in the group, and then knowing that secret ID was the thing that enabled you to link up to the group. Um, mm-hmm. So, like the other end of that spectrum looks more like Matrix, which is a modern protocol with a kind of this surprising design feature, which is that the server kind of controls mm-hmm. who's a member of a group. Um, and so, like you have end to end security between group members, but then you have a server in the middle that's determining mm-hmm. who gets the keys, which kind of breaks the model, right? And like, this sounds closer to the original signal, like the, the thing we're describing with using authenticated data and, you know, nominated group members that are kind of confirmed in the protocol kind of pushes things back towards the model where 
you know, individual participants or clients or endpoints are actively involved in the security decision of who's in the group. So it sounds to me like you're saying that like one thing that MLS does is it makes it possible to design mm-hmm. secure group membership protocols that don't depend on a server making sane decisions about who's in the group. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, essentially everything is signed. It's it's very easy. So you know the the list of members is hashed and then fed into the uh, the key schedule. Um, nice. So so that, that's how you have agreement on who's in the group and who's not. So yeah. um, it's it, it's very subtle, but obviously on on Signal when you or with the Signal protocol when you send a message, you know exactly who's going to receive it because you encrypt it individually for everybody. So. Mm-hmm. Logically, you know who who you're encrypting it to. You know the same is true for MLS, but the the one addition here is that um, the uh, when you receive a message, you also know you know who the sender thought they were sending it to. Cool. Uh, so it, it's very subtle, but that that's essentially the the guarantee you get here. That's very cool because that's the thing you don't get in signal groups. You don't know everyone else that this person was trying to send to because it's all pairwise. And if you receive a message and you're like, why is Bobby trying to send this to some key that I've never seen that does not match what my device sees as um, as the membership of the group? That's pretty cool. That does rely on like the server just kind of forwarding messages to you or whatever the delivery service in the in the architecture document and that rely and then if you can have your own client that does whatever it wants that can detect or reject or whatever it wants but that's cool that's interesting okay let me just reiterate the server can absolutely not inject participants because um Uh the server is not a member so um there's this add operation Mm -hmm. Um, that can only be performed by an existing member. However, there is also a way for a server or let's say generally an outside party to suggest uh, other members. Um, but that requires the outside party you know, to have a well-defined credential and to sign that request. And then that can be honored and everybody will see that that was a suggestion from the server. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's a controlled way how you can add people to a group, but you can never do that, you know, stealthily. So it's it's mm. fully transparent among the group members um, to avoid any problems with you know ghost users. Yeah, I was gonna say this is like a known or at least worried about issue of just someone inserting someone into a group and it not being, if not cryptographically um, detectable. It's not easy to detect that someone is just getting looped into all your messages silently or adding a new device to an existing right. account or something like that. Awesome. One last thing before we kind of talk about the a little bit more protocol document sort of stuff is one thing about the chem design as opposed to strictly diffie hellman design is it doesn't give you the nice associativity and commutivity niceness of diffie hellman ish primitives, uh, which is a it's a whole thing with post-quantum is that we don't have a, a nice Diffie-Hellman-like primitive, you know, RIP, SIDH, which was the, one of the, well, one <laughs> of the closest things that we had that's now dead. Um, you, can't make, drop, make it, you can't drop associativity <laughs> and commutivity into a conversation and just assume that I understand what the hell you're talking about. Okay, okay. Basically, if you could use Diffie-Hellman things or p- primitives that instead of a chem that don't have those properties, you could apply updates to the tree in, quote, any order, and it would all compute out to the same the same values. But because they're using chems, uh, the ordering matters because you can't just swap the order around, sort of like with multiplication. Like if you do two times three, it's the same value as three times two. It doesn't matter what order you go, you'll, get, you'll still get six. Um, chems is more like matrix multiplication where yeah, yeah the, the side I do it on matters. Yeah. Well, what, so I, I know enough to write Diffie-Hellman, right? What's the intuition for... Chems is based on at root, like for like a for a conventional Chems algorithm or whatever. It's still going to be based on something like Diffie Hellman, right? So what what what's breaking associativity and commutativity there? Is that a question for me? Sure. One, one of you knows because <laughs> I just started asking the question and then answering the question instead of asking you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
So I'm, I'm not an expert on like key exchange primitives, but essentially CAMs are a different primitive than Diffie-Hellman. And it's, it's what's, you know, being mandated by NIST, for example, from, for the competition of the, the post-quantum resistant primitives, simply because that works better. And I think you, you were mentioning it earlier, earlier the, there were some Diffie-Hellman attempts uh, mm-hmm. for post-quantum resistant primitives that didn't really hold up so well. But yeah. who knows, maybe going forward, we'll have them again. But, uh, you know, from a very pragmatic standpoint, if you want to have an easy way to upgrade to post-quantum resistance for a protocol, you use CHEMS. And that's mm-hmm. essentially one of the reasons why MLS is using CHEMS. Another one, um, maybe this is interesting for you. Originally, there, there was something else before TreeCHEM uh, called ART, Asynchronous mm-hmm. Ratcheting Trees, which was completely Diffie-Hellman based. And that was more flexible in the sense that the updates of members, when they update their key material, um, to a certain degree, you could do that in a random order. Um, Mm -hmm. So that was nice because you didn't have to have this clock that synchronizes everything. It did also have some downsides. So there was, um, it was more of an academic effort initially. It was a great Mm -hmm. idea because it actually introduced a binary tree uh, for messaging which is fairly new and uh, sort of kickstarted the whole thing. I uh, had some downsides because also um, it was really hard to uh, have dynamic groups where, you know, people join and leave. So it worked hmm. really well when you had a group with a static set of users, which is mm-hmm. not very realistic in a messenger, obviously. Mm-hmm. So maybe we could have worked around those problems eventually, but we didn't at the time. And, and so CAMs were a lot easier in that sense because it meant that we could have blank nodes, like empty nodes in the binary tree, mm-hmm. uh, which made it you know, easy to construct them when you bootstrap a group. It made it easy also when people were leaving because you could just delete you know, the set of nodes between their leaf and the root. Um, oh. So you, you would essentially punch holes in that uh, binary tree uh, and... So that's how you make sure that they don't have access to um, private key material anymore. Because mm-hmm. they only knew the, the private keys of those nodes. So if you remove them from the tree and everybody you know, now cams to other nodes, those that are left, mm-hmm. um, then the evicted member cannot decrypt any of those cams. Mm-hmm. But we can't do that anymore with the updated one? No, no, that, that's what we can do with tree cam essentially. Oh, great. Because, okay, because the tree does not need, you know, uh, to have uh, full nodes everywhere. Got like it. In, in theory, you can randomly delete nodes in the context of tree cam, and it still works. It's just that the efficiency is not going to be as good anymore. Right. Okay. This does, as you said, basically mean you have to maintain a little bit more state on all of your ends. You have to maintain a bit of a clock. You have to maintain, uh, you have to rely on ordering from your server or your delivery service. That sounds a little bit more annoying, but the, the being able to delete whole swaths of the, of the tree because of tree cam uh, does sound really nice. So yeah, that's exactly it. So the, the, the downside, if you will, is that the delivery service is essentially a clock and orders messages. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so there are two ways of doing that. The um, more intuitive one is that that happens in real time. So whenever you try and send a commit message, the server is going to check, you know, what epoch is it? Is is your commit message, does it have the right epoch number? And if if somebody sent a message just before, then yours is going to get rejected. And then you have to try again. so it's really just a counter that, that runs on the server. It's not, in okay. terms of state keeping, it's super easy, but it, it does require having this real-time ordering mechanism. The alternative would be to not do it in real time, like in completely asynchronous systems where, uh-huh. you know, not even the server is guaranteed to be online. You, <laughs> could, um, you could do it differently. You could actually fork the groups uh, and then reconcile them later. So if you have some mechanism to determine mm. the order after the fact, uh, you can still do that. But what you need to do on the clients is essentially four groups. So you have more state. That's fascinating. Has anyone written about, is that in the architecture document? I'm, yes. I, 
the, cool. I'm going to go read more about that. But it has a very that. fancy name. So the, there is the uh, the strongly consistent delivery service, I believe it's called, and the eventually consistent one. Cool. Um, so it's yeah, it's, it's not super intuitive, um, but that's what it is. I think this is also what Metrics has been looking at. There's also uh, like a small deployment of, of and very early deployment of MLS in a protocol called uh, P2 Panda, which is uh-huh. um, some sort of alternative to secure Scalabot. If okay. I'm not mistaken. So it is peer to peer. It is decentralized. It, it does work, but most systems are not peer to peer and decentralized. Um, mm-hmm. So this is cool. All right, uh, we have links to the architecture document in our show notes. I'm going to go read more about the different consistency models because I'm curious about the different solutions. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Thomas. Let's pivot to some of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking as if I have lots of questions, right? So, <laughs> so. <laughs> I, mean, I do have some like I have some low level kind of technical and standardization questions about how MLS came back, but I'm still I want to make sure I have my head totally around the model here, right? So, like we're we're kind of like cackling to each other as we're talking to you, which has to be a weird off putting experience. But like <laughs> we all have some like preconceived notions about IETF cryptography, which are based in like you know mid 2000s ideas of how ietf cryptography design works and not you know more more modern ietf processes right and like to start with like just the idea of a large ambitious new crypto system being designed yeah. like afresh from ietf like not like already done in the industry somewhere and then standardized out um or kind of percolating the way the signal model kind of became for a while the de facto yeah. standard for yeah. all new um, you know, messaging crypto, right? But here it's like a brand new idea. It's a new service model, um, you know, and it's kind of, it's it's designed from scratch from IETF. So I'm still, I, this all makes sense, right? Like all, all the things that you're talking about are like, I can see now why, what the motivation would be to do something like this, right? So I guess the last service model question I have about this, right, is we, you're calling this MLS, right? Which is kind of like obviously a reference to TLS, right? It's like multi-point <laughs> TLS is essentially what we're talking about here. The way that I think about like secure messaging is almost entirely motivated by privacy technology. It's Signal, right? And before mm-hmm. Signal, it was Sigma and OTR and all that stuff. And then it's like, you mm-hmm. know, all the commercial messaging applications. And in those kinds of applications, you do a lot of work on like a message by message basis to, you know, keep post compromise security to maximize privacy. If you imagine like a dial of like cryptographic overhead versus privacy, right? In Signal, that dial is all the way set over to 11. Um, like you're assuming that, you know, state level adversaries are trying to get all of your individual messages. A- am I right kind of to, to, to see that MLS is more of kind of a low level protocol, that it's not inherently privacy technology? Obviously, it's a basis for privacy technology, but it's like, while we're talking about this, I'm just imagining running a routing protocol on top of it, right? Lots of messages all the time. I care a lot less about the integrity of individual messages. I have a group membership system. I want secure messaging. I want like all my points to have individual keys and some kind of cryptographic notion of who's in the group or not. But I don't want to spend a lot of overhead trying to make sure that state level adversaries can't read a message once they've compromised a router for, for like for five minutes. Am I right to, to, to kind of assume that like, MLS gives us enough knobs where we can dial overhead down so that we can run it literally kind of as a group TLS system or as a group message, as a group DTLS system, really. Um, but is that right? Or like, is is there kind of like intrinsically a lot of overhead in the protocol? Uh, yeah, excellent question. And just to go back to what, what you said initially, um, it is definitely a Greenfield project at ITF. Like there, there hasn't mm. been any any precedence uh, to that specifically. Yeah, There's been TLS, obviously, but TLS is more of an evolution. Of, yep. of an older protocol um, yep. and, and has some, you know, some baggage, obviously. Uh, <laughs> it, it mimics TLS in the sense that, you know, we try to have a super strong and, and tight collaboration with academia from day one, essentially, to have formal verification, yeah. to have proofs. Because obviously, when, when you roll your own, and, and that's what we did here, um, <laughs> you, you want to do that in the best possible way. And so... And they also received a lot of input from the industry. Um, and that's, like, in my mind, I, I think of MLS as some sort of a Swiss army knife of end-to-end encryption in a way, because it could be used in different scenarios. Like, it could be used for enterprise messaging mm-hmm. because, you know, it is scalable, because it has all the security features, um, because if you don't care about privacy, 
it's fairly easy to deploy on a server and um, you don't need a lot of overhead on the architecture, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that was has always been super important to me um, was that you should be able to run MLS you know, in an architecture that really cares about privacy as well, you know, in the same mm -hmm. vein as Signal does. Like there shouldn't be anything, you know, prohibitive uh, in the protocol that you couldn't do that. Um, so the protocol itself is not enough to give you a completely private system because it's really just one component. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to a degree, it is agnostic. Like, you know, if, again, if you take Double Ratchet and, and X3DH, that when you know it's run inside of, of the signal app, it's super private. If you run that inside of WhatsApp, there's still tons of metadata, but the, it's agnostic to the protocol as such. And mm -hmm. um, the same is true for MLS. So Good. running okay. MLS in a, in a really private environment um, or in a really private way, we think that that's possible. Um, that's in mm -hmm. fact what we're working on right now, but that's really more on the architecture side and, and not, not on the protocol side. Mm -hmm. D ties into you and basically exactly what you said. You have WhatsApp, which has more as a full service, as a full end to end service of how it's a messaging application. It has more metadata about its membership and its groups than, say, Signal, which looks very, very similar, but it has added other things to its full end to end service, such as the group membership privacy from the server and anyone else that's looking at what's happening and other privacy features that, you know, if you put Signal and WhatsApp side by side, you're like, oh, they both use Signal protocol. They both use double ratchet and, you know, triple Diffie helmet protocol, but it's the next layer up at more of the application level that more privacy parts. And you're basically saying that MLS, the kind of swap out for double ratchet and triple Diffie Hellman plays a similar role you but it doesn't it's trying to purposely be efficient and enable the more privacy oriented applications like a signal in general which that sounds really great i think you mentioned earlier that cisco is using mls are they using it for a like messaging application or are they using it for calling so i'm not affiliated with cisco in any way okay i think okay. they're using it for conference calling oh that's interesting so they're using mls to manage their keying material for a large end-to-end -end encrypted conference call. Yeah, I think so, they uh, also uh, use it for large WebEx rooms, which is their like quasi Slack competitor. But I'm not okay. sure. That, that okay, that might well, be the case. Well, I should. Uh, I'll stop asking you about somebody <laughs> somebody else's product. But okay, that's interesting. So that sounds like they are using MLS to do group key agreement, but they're not using it for signal or slack or whatsapp they're using it well ignore what david just said for the <laughs> for the video calling part they're using it in a completely different setting they're using it to do group key agreement but for video calling um so that's kind of speaking to what thomas was basically saying which is like yeah you can use it for quote new gen signal or high, you know very large groups and to end encrypted slack but you can also use it for i just need a key that's efficiently updatable for people coming and going from my large application, such as a big end-to-end -end encrypted call, web call. Yeah, you don't uh, want pairwise keys for a video call. That's not going to be fun for anybody. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, MLS was designed for asynchronous communication uh, to start mm -hmm. with. But mm -hmm. um, you do have this problem for conference calling that you do have many participants and you want end-to-end -end mm -hmm. encryption. And so at this point, MLS is the only protocol that can really give you that, more or less. Uh, you know, so that's why MLS is being used in that context. But it wasn't like specifically tuned for real-time communication. So why did MLS start in the IETF, though? Like, <laughs> who started that? What was the origin story? Because, I mean, it sounds like it went well. And, like, clearly, you know, Cisco's using it for some things. Wire's using it for some things, I think. I'm sure other people are using it. But uh, how, did, how did that come about? Yeah, I think I think there were multiple starting points uh, to how it came about. So one one is the one thing is the motivation to have a more efficient protocol. And so technically, I think this asynchronous budgeting tree uh, paper is what mm -hmm. started it on the protocol level. 
think Cisco was looking through that problem. Uh, and then later on, um, Mozilla and Wire and, and others sort of came together and, and thought, you know, we should, we, we have the same goals here, essentially, and we should bring that to ITF. Another motivation was that there was no, you know, full specification of the Signal protocol at the time down to the wire format. Yeah. Meaning you didn't have a document you could use to do your own implementation. Um, and there weren't many implementations around those from Signal themselves. They were published under the GPL, which didn't work uh, for a lot of folks. <laughs> you could license it uh, commercially. But let's say end-to-end -end encryption was not as accessible as it is now. So now we mm -hmm. have a full specification that academia can easily analyze that people can use to do implementations. We have several implementations now. That are some of them open source and they interoperate. So this has been happening in the yes. past weeks. Yes. So in a way, um, this is a bit of a new era in terms of accessibility to end-to-end -end encryption technology. Fantastic. To jump off that, I've linked several papers of, as far as I can tell, independent academic groups analyzing different properties of MLS based on the spec that's available, based on these implementations that are available which is very nice because everyone kind of being like, well, I'm going to look at a very small part of the signal service or the signal quote protocol, because you have to only agree. You can only talk about like the thing that has like a well understood name of what you're talking about to do formal analysis, modeling, you know, uh, looking at security properties of such and such a thing. Having that for MLS and especially for TreeCam, it makes more academic analysis better available because everyone understands what we're talking about. They can point to a document and say, this thing, I'm going to analyze this thing as opposed to a kind of wibbly amorphous, the thing implemented by Lib Signal, uh, which is not everyone's favorite. Can you just describe what formal academic analysis has been done for MLS versus tree cam or I think continuous group key agreement is like the property that this got the most analysis out of it. Basically, has there been a high level symbolic analysis of MLS, the protocol versus tree cam? So other aspects besides tree cam have been looked at. Um, Good. Okay. But this is also, you know, where you reach the limits of what you can do today. Uh, uh -huh. It is, it is a complex protocol. Okay. And when you analyze something, you always have to focus you know, on, on some aspects of it. So I, I don't think every aspect of, of MLS has been fully covered uh, okay. simply because that would be really hard. And um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not, you know, a uh, trained cryptographer uh, with an academic <laughs> background. So um, I might not give you all the answers here, <laughs> but I think it has received a lot of attention. I remember... Maybe 10 years ago, you know, there was like one paper on the Signal protocol at the time, and that was it. Uh -huh. Academia did not look at secure messaging too much. <laughs> and, and then there was all of a sudden, you know, this explosion of academic interest in all of yeah. that. And obviously Signal was super interesting, but then, you know, MLS could sort of also get the, the interests from academia and, and mm -hmm. you know, have people... Uh, look at it. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. great because that's frankly, that's how it should be done. Because if just, you know, a bunch of engineers, and I'm including myself here, specifically, <laughs> you know, just have a good feeling about, you know, how a protocol <laughs> should be designed, that that doesn't end well, typically. So mm -hmm. um, that's why you want, you want the former proofs. Mm -hmm. Is there any, uh, like, uh, algorithm negotiation in MLS? Or is that, uh, like, as you mentioned, it's built around a chem, and we mentioned there's post quantum chems, and there's like kind of DH-ish chems, um, is that something that's chosen kind of at deploy time or is that something that's negotiated by clients? Or? Yeah, that, that's one of the perks of, of ITF. Essentially, you have to have some crypto agility there. You have to have mm. cipher suites. Mm -hmm. um, some people like it, some don't. What it means in practice is the, the protocol document specifies, I think, five or six, six, yeah, that are all not post-quantum <laughs> yet. And they can get negotiated. However... In practice, it's going to be quite different from TLS because you also don't, so first of all, you don't have these downgrade attacks uh, at this time at least uh, because mm -hmm. there's only one version. Mm -hmm. The other thing is 
you will probably, you know, pick the one that is sort of recommended, like it's called the mandatory to implement MTI Surface Suite. Uh, which is Curve 25519 and AES, uh, more or less. Yeah. And yeah, the, there are the NIST curves for those who need that for mm -hmm. compliance reasons. Mm -hmm. And then at some point we will have Cypher Suites with uh, post-quantum primitives, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I see that the grease, that random uh, values in the key agreement fields that we kind of learned about in TLS negotiation, that's already in there. That's yeah, cool. that was a very last minute addition. Yeah. <laughs> Someone ran in and was like, hey, <laughs> we should probably just not take a step back in this new version negotiation we're introducing here. Um, I'm shocked that towards the end of the process, somebody went in and IETF the whole protocol up. <laughs> so we, we found we found exactly one thing for me not to like about MLS. <laughs> <It's a slogan. laughs> the crypto agility. Yeah, I just in general the idea of it's not just it's also like if you're an implementer now, then you have some pressure to like, okay, I have to implement the NIST part of this too. Like it's so much cleaner if you have mm -hmm. like the wire guard model where it's just like, look, here's the protocol, just go implement this. Noise kind of works the same way where you just kind of read it top to bottom, implement it, and you're done. And here it's like, I need to indirect everything because somebody else might need to add a cipher suite to that. So but it's, 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 it's fine. You, you... Yes and no. I mean, the, the big difference is whether or not you consider uh, your system to be interoperable. Like TLS, it's, it's different because you have a client that is going to talk to random servers. So you have mm -hmm. to you know be compatible with all of them in a way. With MLS, if you have your own deployment, you pick one. And then you you stop having crypto agility, and that's it. Mm -hmm. it. It doesn't preclude you from like you do not need to implement all of them. You can do whatever you so want. So, like there. you, if you deploy MLS, if you're Cisco, and you're like, I'm gonna pick the P fifty six Cipher Suite because I know that most of my users don't care so much about whatever the IATF ish crypto. Cypher Suite is. I care about NIST compatible Cypher Suites because I service these kinds of customers. So I am just going to be like, cool, P56, AES, that's my only Cypher Suite and I control all of my clients and, and yada, yada, yada. That helps. I have a question about federation. It seems like MLS might be open to federation in a way that some other protocols are not. Would that put more pressure on keeping open the set of cipher suites that an implementation supports or negotiates if you're trying to, quote, interop with other federation instances? Yeah, good question. And I think it's very much an open question. So first of all, okay. regarding federation, so there were two things during the design process where MLS, you know, should not solve the problem, but also not be prohibitive in any mm -hmm. way. And that is privacy and federation. So it should be able, you know, to work in an environment that is, you know, similar to signal, but also in an environment that is similar to matrix in terms of federation. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, this is a very much an open question. To some extent, uh, interoperability would be a lot easier if there was just one cipher suite because and there is no <laughs> negotiation. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, we would see that over time. How, how that's going to work. There's this other really early day effort at ITF called MIMI, more instant messaging interoperability. So this is more about federation and agreeing and stuff, et cetera. But it's so early, you, it's, you know, it's hard to say how, how that's going to go and in which direction. So again, I mean, it's sort of agnostic of, of federation as such, but it, it doesn't prevent you using it. Yeah, that's nice. Is there interest in using MLS as like a path forward? Because with the new, I, I think these passed the EU regulations about like all these messaging oh. platforms have to interop. I'm not sure what the status of that is, but. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure anyone knows what the real status of that <laughs> is, but um, that, that's essentially what sort of motivated uh, Mimi, this new working group to, you know, look for potential technological solutions to that, but. The whole effort is political, obviously, so <laughs> we we have to see. Obviously, MLS is some sort of a candidate in that context, you know, that vendors could potentially agree on. But we still have to deploy it first. Yeah, so, the, I mean, it took a while to, to get to this stage. Like, it took five years, all in all. 
uh, which mm. is a really long time, obviously, but that's also because it's never been done before at ITF. And now I think we will see some deployments and and then we will gather some experience and, and see how it works. Yeah. It's kind of hard to yeah, predict every aspect of it. Still faster than uh, than a TLS 1.3 was, so that you, uh, you beat them. <laughs> Well, there were far fewer stakeholders as well, and that was yeah. the advantage. And, and there was not a lot of disagreement in the working group, which was really nice. Um, nice. I'm re- really not an ITF expert, so this was my first rodeo, really. From what I hear in other groups, you know, there's much more drama and disagreement. So in that sense, it, it was a pretty smooth ride. Nice. I'm happy for you that you had a nice ITF experience. <laughs> I'm not jealous at all. <laughs> no, I, I'm, it's more about what you're not saying right now, yeah. Yeah, I, I've had a fine IATF, IRTF experience. There's just a lot of bureaucracy. You've reached almost barely grazing your fingers on the finish line of TLS, of sorry, MLS 1.0. Is this 1.0? Are you versioning it? Um, I mean, it has to be versioned. That's a good question, whether we can actually call it one at all. I think we just call it MS at this point. <laughs> but if there's going to be another version, then for sure uh, it's going to be versioned. Were there things that got bounced from the scope for this? That like, right. do, you have a, do you have a thought about like what a next version would be? It'd be, it'd be great if the answer was no. Right? <laughs> but like, <laughs> do you think there will be a 2.0 like in the near future? Well, I don't know about the near future, but I mean, the, there will be evolution because messaging protocols, you know, evolve. We had OTR, mm-hmm. which was fantastic in a way because it solved, it was really modern, had modern properties that didn't exist before, but mm-hmm. then it didn't work on, on mobile phones. And then Signal came along, which took all these properties and actually made them work and has been mm-hmm. fantastic ever since. Uh, didn't scale well. This is, you know, where MLS fits in. And and there's going to be other things. So yeah, things were bounce, of course. Um, there's a million things you can do. You know, you can try to be more efficient. You can have better PCS. But in a way, when when you design these systems, it's a bit like having a balloon filled with water. So if you you know grab it on one hand and you squeeze it for a split second, you think you've made it shrink, but what you really did is you pushed the water somewhere else. <laughs> so you know when you make it faster on one end then you probably compromised on some security aspect. So, and, and it's, it's relatively rare that you have these leaps where you really just innovate without compromising uh, too much. But yeah, to answer your question, we could have done this in different ways. Uh, and, and over the past five years, many people uh, came up with a lot of different ideas on how it could have been done, etc. So all of these things would be candidates for future versions. But what mm-hmm. we really need is some experience with this version, uh, mm. see how it works. Because on an academic level, you know, you can be really creative and, and that's fantastic, but it actually needs to address uh, real problems. Mm-hmm. All right. Do we have anything else? I was just going to say congratulations to yourself and everyone else that, that worked on MLS. I think I remember first hearing about this at... Uh at like RWC and I want to say 2019, maybe 2018, yeah. when Richard Barnes gave a talk. So it's yeah. been, been quite the journey since then. Yes. It's very, very big accomplishment, as you said, a, a greenfield, like complex protocol in the IETF, first end-to-end secure messaging protocol that I'm aware of. I'm very excited that all the interoperable implementations are up and running, including OpenMLS, which is a Rust implementation. Um, that I have pushed some commits to of little ones. I'm paying close attention to that one to play with. Very exciting. Congratulations. Hopefully it will get deployed in more places. It can keep evolving and we can keep learning about it and publishing analysis of it. Anything else we want to touch on before we wrap up? Well, I want to say thank you very much on behalf of all the people who worked on MLS. It's really been a lot of different people uh, and great people who brought in a lot of different ideas and made it what it is today. Yeah. Raphael, thank you very much for coming on our show. (laughs) Well, thank you for having me. Security, cryptography, whatever is a side project from Deirdre Connolly, Thomas Patachik, and David Adrian. Our editor is Nettie Smith. You can find the podcast on Twitter at SCWPod, and the hosts on Twitter at Durham Crushulum, at TQBF, and at David C. Adrian. You can buy merchandise at merch.securitycryptographywhatever.com. Thank you for listening.